Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Ford Presidential Library. My name is Elaine Didier, and it's my privilege to serve as the director of the library here in Ann Arbor and also the museum in Grand Rapids. We are very pleased to have you with us this evening for our third public program in the winter series, and what a winter it has been. So uh, we, uh, we give you double marks for attending, and also because this program had to be canceled last October due to the government shutdown. Uh, you are loyal fans and uh, loyal devotees of President Ford, and I know we're going to have a really good program this evening. Tonight's uh, offering is brought to you by the National Archives and Records Administration, which is our parent organization in partnership with the Ford Presidential Foundation. We're very grateful to all of you who are members of Friends of Ford and contributors to the Ford Foundation. It is your ongoing support that makes us able to bring in outstanding speakers and provide educational programs and feature exhibits, as well as provide travel grants to scholars from around the world to come to the library. Tonight's program, as usual, is being taped by U of M's Michigan Media. When we get to the question program following the presentation, we hope you will go to the microphone at the back of the center aisle to ask your question, so it will be included on the recording. And finally, the standard bit of housekeeping before we begin, would you please make sure your cell phones and other electronic devices are turned off. Tonight is a different format. For us, we're going to have a moderated discussion based around Jim Cannon's recent book, Gerald R. Ford, An Honorable Life. The book was published by the U of M Press in May of 2013, about two years after the passing of Jim Cannon, who was one of President Ford's closest advisors. To begin, I'd like to share some background about the author, James Cannon. In a career that spanned five decades, James Cannon rose from a club reporter covering City Hall to a trusted presidential aide with an office in the West Wing. He graduated from the University of Alabama and served in the Army and the Office of Strategic Services in World War II. He was a reporter at several newspapers before joining the Baltimore Sun, for which he covered the Korean War. A 2010 article in The Sun recounted how he had lugged around a well-stocked traveling bar in Korea. He felt alcoholic beverages made his sources more talkative. <laughs> Remember that when you're dealing with reporters. Whiskey is always the best medium of exchange, he said, and it was especially so in Korea. In a 2010 interview, he recounted that a couple of bottles of whiskey got a Jeep for the Baltimore Sun, and one more got it painted. Those are the times of war. His distinguished uh, journalism career took him from the Baltimore Sun to Time Magazine for two years, and then Newsweek for another 13 years. After that, he left journalism because he wanted to, quote, get out of the grandstand and go down to the playing field. He joined the staff of New York Governor Nelson Rockefeller, and when President Ford appointed Rockefeller to be vice president, Jim Cannon followed him to Washington. In 1975, President Ford named Jim Cannon as a presidential assistant and executive director of the White House Domestic Policy Council, where he worked directly with President Ford, cabinet members, and the White House senior staff. After President Ford left the White House in 1977, Jim Cannon moved on to be chief of staff to Howard Baker as the Senate Majority Leader. In retirement, which really wasn't a retirement, Jim Cannon worked as a political consultant and returned to his journalism roots. In 1994, he published a comprehensive biography of President Ford, Time and Chance, Gerald Ford's Appointment with History. Then in 2005, he began working on a second book, working very closely with several of our archivists who are here with us tonight. It's a great pleasure for us to be hosting Jim Cannon's sons, Jim and Scott, for a discussion of the second book, Gerald R. Ford, An Honorable Life. Let me close the introduction with a comment from Tom Brokaw in a tribute to Jim Cannon. Jim was a national treasure too few people outside the Beltway knew or appreciated. He was always one of the most thoughtful, level-headed, and engaging players I came to know in my Washington years. As a White House reporter, I always trusted what he told me because he always told me straight in the soft Alabama accent. And you're going to see that in just a moment. To open the program, we're going to show a three and a half minute clip from American President's Life Portrait series, which was broadcast on American History TV. In this section, you will see James Cannon is interviewed by C-SPAN's Lou Ketchum on November 22nd, 1999. And Kate will roll the tape.
Good evening from the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Museum in Grand Rapids, Michigan. For the next two and a half hours, we'll take your questions and comments about the 38th president, the president who served in that office without having been directly elected president or vice president. Gerald Ford grew up in Grand Rapids, about 140 miles northwest of Detroit, and represented this city and the surrounding district in Congress for 25 years, becoming vice president and president on the recognition of Richard Nixon. And joining us in a replica of Gerald Ford's Oval Office here in the museum is James Cannon, who's author of Time and Chance, Gerald Ford's Appointment to History. Thanks very much for being with us. Thank you, Lou. The last line of your book about Gerald Ford is this. The abiding truth of the presidency of Gerald Ford is that in this splendid American democracy, the last line of your book about Gerald Ford is this. The abiding truth of the presidency of Gerald Ford is that in this splendid American democracy, this one good man would make such a difference. What difference did he make? Lou, to answer that question, let's look first at the state of the Union when Nixon left. Number one, you had a catastrophic economic situation. Inflation was up, unemployment was up, interest rates were up, it was a terrible energy crisis. People were getting in fist fights at the filling station. Number two, the Cold War was uh, in some ways at its peak. Armed American soldiers were facing armed Russian soldiers through much of Europe, each backed up by thousands of uh, nuclear weapons. So the last uh, great dictator, uh, Brezhnev, uh, in office in Moscow. Third, the Vietnam War was still going on. A war that had divided America, stained the hands and reputation of three presidents, Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon. Fourth, the White House had been dishonored, not only by Nixon and Watergate, but also because the office had already been diminished when Lyndon Johnson failed as a war leader. So then look at the situation when Ford left the office. The economy was prospering, inflation was down, interest rates were down, unemployment was, uh, uh, unemployment was up, the country was on the verge of prosperity again. Second, the Cold War had not ended, but we were seeing the beginning of the end of the Cold War. And importantly, President Ford in Helsinki had negotiated and signed a treaty against uh, opposition from both Democrats and Republicans that opened the way for democracy in communist Europe. Third, Vietnam had ended, not in the way Ford wanted it to end but it had ended. When Ford left office, no American in uniform was in harm's way in the world. In the world. And fourth, and finally, by his own honesty, he was President Ford restored the integrity. We could believe our president again. We could believe your president was telling the truth. That was Full of natural resources and environment, and the LSNA program in the environment. He is a non-resident senior fellow in the Governance Studies program at the Brookings Institution in Washington. Along with his academic appointments, Professor Rabe is affiliated with numerous local and international associations and serves on multiple editorial boards. Much of Professor Rabe's recent research examines state and regional development of policies to reduce greenhouse gases. And he has received multiple awards for his contributions both for scholarship and for policy making. However, the reason Professor Rabe is invited to be here tonight is not all those wonderful things, but because he has become the Ford School of Public Policy's official in-house expert of, on, and champion of President Ford. And it is in that capacity that caused us to invite him to be our moderator this evening. Barry, a pleasure to have you on the Ford Library stage. Thank you, Elaine, and, and good evening. The publication of a fine book is always cause for celebration. And that is indeed the case tonight. But 
I think that the publication of a book takes on special poignancy when that celebration occurs without the author being present because of death. And that is the situation we find tonight. For me, thinking about this always brings back what for me was one of the very saddest days, times on this campus and the time that I have been here. And that is when we heard nearly 20 years ago that Jack Walker had died. Some of you know Jack Walker or knew him. He's a distinguished political scientist. At the time of his death, he was the chair of the political science department. And he died during a sabbatical in an automobile accident in Northern California. He was 50 years old. It was a time of tremendous shock and sadness. And this is the kind of event in particular that Jack would have loved. In fact, Jack was also the director for a time of the Institute for Public Policy Studies, now the Gerald R. Ford School. And some suggested he was one of the very first faculty members that thought it would really be a great idea to name the School of Public Policy after Gerald Ford. Well, after that shock, and after the, the grievous nature of that loss sunk in, and after a fitting memorial service, a question emerged. What about the book? And there were a small platoon of faculty and graduate students who knew that Jack had labored for about 15 years to try to write what he had hoped would be the definitive work on the role of interest groups in American politics. And so bit by bit, piece by piece, that platoon pulled together what remains one of the most distinguished contributions to our understanding of the role of interest groups in American politics published in the last half century, published also by the University of Michigan Press. I always thought that that gathering of students and colleagues was an extraordinary tribute to Jack Walker to finish the book. And tonight, how extraordinary it is to have the two sons of Jim Cannon who helped finish the book and make possible tonight's event join us for this activity. Let me introduce both Jim and Scott, ask them to come to the stage, and then we'll begin this conversation. First, Scott Cannon, the younger son of James and Sherry Cannon, as the bio sketches note. He grew up primarily in New York, following his dad's career in journalism and with Nelson Rockefeller. He then moved to the South, where he earned a degree in English and creative writing from Florida State, writing in the genes held a range of jobs, but followed his dad into journalism with the Orlando Sentinel, and then became the outdoor editor and publicist for the Florida Division of Tourism. Later back, went back into journalism after a speech, uh, stint of speech writing for Senator Pete Domenici, freelancing in Sarasota for newspapers and magazines. But in 1988, he went back to Washington and the Department of State where he served as a writer and editor in a range of projects and worked closely with his dad on Time and Chance, the first Jim Cannon book about President Ford before its publication in 1994. He is married to Annie Diaz Cannon and is the father of son Dawson at Arizona State University and daughter Elena in middle school. Scott, welcome. Jim Cannon IV, not to be confused with the third. The older son, but as the bio sketch notes, only by 14 months. Like his brother, he grew up principally in New York, but headed west, unlike his brother going to the south, to Western Washington University, where he earned a degree in physics. And then a bit later, a master's degree in nuclear engineering at the University of Washington. Jim worked for about a decade as a shift engineer at a nu at nuclear power plants, but in 1990 he left to enter federal service. Federal service was also in the genes. The U.S. Department of Nuclear Energy, later the National Nuclear Security Administration, working on nuclear non-proliferation programs in Kazakhstan and Ukraine. A separate topic for a separate time. <laughs> He also worked for Senator Domenici as a legislative fellow on commercial nuclear power issues and currently works as an engineering program manager for renewable energy programs in the Department of the Navy. Last year, he retired from the Navy Reserve as a captain after 28 years of military service. He is married to Lucy Hollins Cannon, librarian for an elementary school in Fairfax County, Virginia. Jim, welcome. <laughs>
Gentlemen, good to be with you again. Again, good to be here. Let's begin by talking not so much about the substance of the book, we'll get to that in a bit, but the story of the completion of the book, the extent to which you were aware of it or involved in the development of it by your dad, what you found and transitioned into playing the roles that you did in some of the latter stages. Tell us a little bit about your odyssey in getting into the book publishing business. Well, it was uh, rather sudden. Um, Dad had, uh, he, uh, as, as you noted, he wrote Time and Chance. It was published back in 1994. And uh, this uh, new book, Gerald R. Gerald R. Ford, An Honorable Life, was really the book that he set out to write back in the 90s because he wanted to document the presidency, as he recalled it, from working in the White House. Um, however, in the 90s, the more he learned about the young Jerry Ford, the more fascinated he became by that story of a young man with a challenging uh, time growing up. And so he set aside 4-2, as he referred to it, and basically wrote Time and Chance, which basically took us up to the uh, when uh, President Ford reached the White House. Um, so he published that in 1994. He, he did some other projects. He wrote, decided he wanted to write a novel, so he wrote a novel, The Apostle Paul, which was published in 2005. And his, uh, his favorite joke was, I always wondered how hard it would be to write a novel. Well, I found out. Uh, it took about five years to get that out. And then he turned his attention back to uh, Ford Two, as he referred to it. And uh, he worked on it essentially for about five to six years up until he fell ill in late 2011. We're very fortunate, we're all very fortunate, I think, that he was an excellent writer and editor, and he worked on it as he went along, so that uh, he was within, literally within pages of finishing the, what he would consider the complete manuscript when he took ill in uh, 2011. And so uh, what we found ourselves with, Jim found, had, it's sort of dad's, was dad's computer support person, so he had the manuscript on the computer. And we told dad that um, in the hospital, we said, we will ensure that this book gets out. You worked on it too hard, and there's too many people that want to read this book, um, so we will get it out. And so it, it kind of fell to us to get in touch with dad's agent, to get the agent to get it to the publisher, University of Michigan Press. And it was about, I guess if you do the math, probably almost a year and a half process. Um, fortunately, the book needed very little editing, and he had a list of uh, photos that um, he had worked on with uh, the librarians, the archivists here, and we were very fortunate that they were so helpful. Um, Ken, who's here tonight, was one of them, and uh, it was essentially putting the project together at that point. We didn't have to do a whole lot of writing, just finishing the last couple pages. But, uh, you know, it was obviously a labor of love, but it was also a, a project that we felt um, deserved to be uh, finished and in print and basically on the shelf as volume two, if you will, in the time of chance. Computer support, Jim. My understanding is you got into this in a number of ways. Your dad's computer expertise might not have been quite what it was in some other areas. Can you talk about what it was like to, to walk into this project and, and the roles that you played? Uh, certainly. and. Um I think that's probably a good way for computer support because I would often get calls at home and you know it's like calling the help center and you know you're trying to walk somebody through this and and dad was uh, of course I have his typewriter from when he was a Korean War correspondent but he was not as familiar with the technology and so sometimes I'd have to kind of you know look up here and do this and I can't figure out something and then I'd one of the great things that, uh, of course, it's a great loss uh, when you're, when any parent dies, but for us, we had the, it was a, a great gift. He, he lived in Georgetown, so we could, so I usually had dinner with him once a week, and then on the weekends, I could help him at, as well. But a lot of it was organizing and, and making so he could find it. Uh, uh, Scott said he was such a good writer and editor, as he would write a chapter and finish it, he would then call it the archive for the vault, and he would send it to me. So I was just kind of tracking as he went along. And some of it, you know, to us nowadays, it seems like nothing, but computer support was, you know, how do I, 
how do I cut, copy, and replace sort of thing. But um, as a writer, he didn't need my help writing. You know, he, like Scott, are very good writers. But I was there to make sure things were, you know, findable and stored in the, in the right location. Um, we were talking about it tonight that he would get zipped files and he would be like, what's a zipped file? And so he'd send it to me and I'd unzip it and send it back to him and piecemeal because uh, and he would often joke and say, you know, like, I'm old enough, I don't want to learn this stuff, I want to write a book. And um, I'm kind of the same way about my car, you know, it's too late for me to figure out how it works. But, but, um, but as we, as Scott said, he, he died and then we're, we were getting calls from very good friends who were like, you've got to publish this book. Otherwise, there will be no such book that has the interviews with key people such as, you know, Donald Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney, but also all the staff people. Those are names we know, but so many people that are in the book. Um, and so it became a, a question of getting it to various people in hard copy, getting them to edit it, which Scott really took the lead on. But it was, uh, again, it was a labor of love because he had spent so much time and he had such a profound respect and admiration for Jerry Ford and a sense that Jerry Ford needed to be remembered and recognized for the, really, the great president he was. And, and Scott, you actually did some writing, an afterword, completing the last chapter. Can you talk about what you did to try to sort of bring that part of the manuscript home and, and, and those things that where you really were following what your, your father had laid out in other cases where you were trying to figure out what to do? Who, who rescued this book um, because, uh, as, as you noted, when an author dies, a book is sort of, a can be a little bit adrift. And uh, so I, I got, had a great friend, though unfortunately I, I still haven't met him, but I had a great friend in, in Tom Dwyer here who uh, kind of led me through the process, through the editing process. The only parts of the book that were left undone, in my opinion, uh, were the uh, well, I asked Dad in the hospital, I said, you know, you've been working on this for six years, what's left? He said, Ford's death. He said, I, I need to write about Ford's death. So we had his notes on what he had planned to write for the last few pages of the book, and I was fortunate, and that's all pretty much information that's out there that I could go find and write into his notes. And if you see the book, it's essentially, there's an editor's note in there about where it begins, but it's only two or three pages that he himself did not complete. And the press asked me to write an afterword, which I was happy to do. Um, unfortunately, I didn't have the entire list of, of people that helped him over the basically 10 years he spent about writing. He spent writing about uh, President Ford. So I had to um, hit the, the most obvious ones I could think of in the afterword and thank them for their help. A lot of folks here at the library, uh, a lot of folks who um, helped with the editing of the book and, and getting it out. But uh, the afterword was really uh, my, you know, my, <coughs> excuse me, my uh, sense of what he would have wanted to say in, in terms of thanking people for helping him through his writing journey. We begin to get a sense of your dad by your comments, by the video clip. Can you tell us more about Jim Cannon as a father? as a journalist, as a public servant. Fill in the human side of, of who this person was. Uh, well, um, Dad would never say this, but I think in, in, in reading the manuscript and working it through the process, I got a very real sense of why he had such a, he felt such a connection with President Ford, and he always referred to him as President Ford. Um, but I think they had very similar backgrounds. They came from very modest beginnings and, and rose to public service. And basically that was their, that was their sense of mission was public service. But um, they were both very uh, modest people who were not self-aggrandizing, they were not self-promoters, and uh, they were down to earth. And um, I think in a sense that that's why they initially were, were very simpatico. Um, I believe I learned uh, through this process and talking with Alan Moore, who helped me edit the manuscript and worked with Dad in the, in the White House, 
one of the things Alan Moore related to me was that when, uh, after they were both out of the White House, Dad was working for Senator Howard Baker, and in 1984, he was out in Dallas. Uh, Dad had had uh, some biopsies done, and he was at, out in Dallas in 1984 at the Republican convention, and he got a call from his doctor that the biopsies were cancer, and he had to come back and begin treatment immediately. <clears throat> so he came back, and uh, he was in Washington, and he got a call from President Ford, and he recounted his own challenges and his struggles with dealing with Mrs. Ford's cancer. And, and my understanding from Alan was that it was a very emotional phone call. And uh, as Alan put it, he says, I think that's when the bond really was cemented between the two men. I, I think uh, when you look at uh, President Ford's childhood, and you know, it's, uh, it's a plug for the, the museum in Grand Rapids, of course, but you, you really, if you, if you have not been, it's, it's well worth the trip. You get a real sense of, as Scott said, the type of person. Well, Dad was very similar in that aspect. He grew up in a very small, modest home in a little town, Athens, Alabama, and it, it's, it's visited the house. I saw it, I should say, about a year and a half ago. He, uh, his parents were very interested in education. They had gone, been able to get um, teaching certificates, going to a, what was referred to then as a, a normal school, a university, now Jackson State University in Alabama. And therefore, education was very important. And it, of course, it was very important in Jerry Ford's life. One of the rules was do your homework, that he was taught by his mother. And as part of this was also the parents seem to be, you know, confident and reliant, but also modest. And he was out like that throughout his life. And I think that was another aspect of their mutual character, quality of the work and performance as a public servant. And, and overall, I think they were just, uh, of course, you know, we're great fans of our fathers like anybody should be. Uh, but there was just this, this personal touch of warmth and friendship because they, they had no pretensions, either President Ford or my father, and therefore there was another natural connection. And you know, President Ford had grown up being a congressman in Grand Rapids. He knew there were many other congressmen, and he was not ever worried about being kind of big man on campus, but rather, I have a job to do, and I'm going to do it. My father was the same way. Whether he was in the newspaper business when he went into public service, and I think that's that's a very important trait, is you're going to do the job right and do it for public good and not just for what nowadays we see often seems to be self-aggrandizing, but they were not that way. Your dad was a point person for domestic policy in the White House. How would you describe their operating style in the White House? Did they, did they know each other well at all before this remarkable coincidence that would bring them together? How would you describe that working piece, realizing that in his later years they became closer and closer as, as, as the years passed? Uh, well, Dad worked for Governor Rockefeller in New York, of course, and um, there's a fascinating sections in the book, in my opinion, a fascinating sections in the book where uh, for both the selection of Ford as vice president and then the selection of uh, Rockefeller as vice president for Ford once Ford assumed office. So Governor Rockefeller, then Vice President Rockefeller, brought his own team to Washington with him. And it was, it was an interesting time for Dad because he came down here to work for, uh, well, not sorry, he came down here, he came to Washington to work for Vice President Rockefeller. But he sort of, uh, but President Ford had promised Vice President Rockefeller that he would have a major say in domestic policy. And so one of the appointments that Rockefeller wanted was to have Dad as the domestic policy advisor. Of course, there was a little bit of resistance on what had been um, the, the Nixon staff and then some of the new Ford staff. Um, but uh, so that's how Dad sort of caught the eye, I, I think, of uh, President Ford was once he started to work on the domestic policy council. And I think, um, you know, when he worked for Governor Rockefeller, similar um, to what Scott's described. You know, he started working on a few small projects. In one case, I remember going up to Albany. The first was an exhibit um, on Al Smith, who had been a famous New York governor. And 
So that was a way that he and Nelson Rockefeller had started out. They met on the campaign trail when Dad was covering the 68 election, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, Rockefeller and them, he and Rockefeller, Nelson Rockefeller had gotten along and uh, he finally said, Nelson Rockefeller finally said, Dad, you want to come work for me? And Dad, that's when the story goes of he decided to get out of the grandstands and onto the playing field. And of course, Nelson Rockefeller was a very dynamic, person, to say the least. Those of us that, like Scott and I, who lived in New York, you, you knew Nelson Rockefeller was a presence and uh, had great ideas for the state of New York and what it could become as the Empire State um, and its history. And I think over time when he went to the White House, there was this opportunity to do more and more. And uh, might just go off. Nope, okay, I just wanted to make sure. Um, you know, because we're being recorded for posterity, so I want to, um, and, and you too. Um, but, but I, I think, um, the relationship that he had with Nelson Rockefeller was a very solid one, um, but with Jerry Ford, I think they had a personal connection. You know, just like you, when you meet somebody new and you kind of think, I feel like I've known this person forever. And I think, as Scott has described, they had this, natural connection. And so they became, you know, at first it was he was the domestic guy under Nelson Rockefeller, caught the eye of President Ford. Once he started to work with President Ford, uh, and there was a few bumpy starts, uh, not in a bad way, just the inexperience of it, uh, he really came on board as a great domestic advisor who President Ford trusted and said, you're my guy for that. Uh, I will note also that Dad wrote a book in 1960, he published a book, uh, called Politics USA, which was sort of back then a handbook for how to get elected. And in the foreword to that book, even back then, he said that in his opinion, politics was the most noble of professions. So that was sort of that was sort of in the back of his mind even 30 years earlier, um, before he got to the White House. I should say, 15 years to make that shift. Right. Yeah. Now you mentioned Nelson Rockefeller and. Rockefeller looms large in this book. And while this is obviously primarily a book about President Ford, there's also much in here about the American vice presidency. There's a wonderful chapter called Confirmation that takes us through the Ford selection and confirmation as vice president with lots of twists and turns that are often lost in more popular accounts. But there's also a lot of frank discussion of the challenges for Nelson Rockefeller to ascend to that position, and then the difficulties that emerged in the Ford-Rockefeller relationship when he was dropped from the ticket in 1976. Can you talk about those aspects of the vice presidency, both the Ford ascension to the vice presidency, but also the, the Rockefeller issues, in, in that case especially because of the close relationship between your dad and a vice president who, by the end of the administration, was in a strained relationship? kind of go backwards and say, first I think that the, uh, the Rockefeller selection, for me, I was rereading a little bit of this morning, just because I find it very interesting. It's, a, it's an inter interesting story. Um, Nelson Rockefeller was somebody who was famous for saying, I never wanted to be vice president of anything. Um, but the, the bottom line was that in his advisors, when President Ford called him and said, I need you to come down here and help me and be vice president, because Basically, he had the stature and the experience. President Ford thought that Nelson Rockefeller would be the best person to take over any unfortunate happenstance that something happened to him. And, and Rockefeller was advised by his own people that he shouldn't do it. That it was, it was he himself, I think, in, he had been offered the vice presidency in 1964, as I recall. He turned it down both times. And he had actually done a study, I think, for Eisenhower about how to improve the vice presidency and uh, what you could do with it, and Rockefeller's uh, uh, resulting decision was, well, really not much. So um, he had zero interest in being vice president, but he said very clearly that um, he felt it was his duty. President Ford had assumed office, obviously, under this cloud uh, from uh, President Nixon resigning, that uh, you had to serve your country. And when the president called and said he needed you, you know, your personal uh, wishes kind of went out the window. So uh, I, I believe that one of the most interesting parts of, of the new book is actually the, the Governor Rockefeller story and how, as you mentioned, 
as the campaign went on, uh, President Ford's advisors were telling him, and, and some were talking to the press and saying, well, you know, our biggest problem is Nelson Rockefeller. Well, Rockefeller obviously didn't appreciate that. But Rockefeller was a stand-up guy, and he told the president at one point in the meeting, he said, Mr. President, I will, you, you need to be reelected, and I will do whatever you want me to do. If you want me to step aside, I will. And it was not that long after that that President Ford called him in and said, well, I think that time has come. Obviously, um, President Ford came to regret that decision on a personal level and I think probably an electoral level, but uh, Rockefeller still was a stand-up guy and he delivered New York delegates so that uh, President Ford would get the nomination over uh, Ronald Reagan. We got to, uh, I'm a big fan of Nelson Rockefeller too, and uh, because he, he really was a big thinker. And he had great ideas, and um, we got to spend the summer staying at their estate up in Terrytown uh, because Nelson Rockefeller was like, you know, you work so hard, just I got an extra house, you can come stay in it. And uh, and now, of course, it's um, they have it sectioned off; you can actually go visit it. But but I think Dad really was fascinated by Nelson Rockefeller because of what he wanted to do in New York State, and. When the idea of the vice presidency came up, as Scott said, I think that's exactly right. Nelson Rockefeller really didn't want it. But he was, you know, imagine you're sitting there, you're this very influential person, you're a Rockefeller, you can do whatever you want, and you have entered into the arena of public service. And the President of the United States calls you, who certainly had, as we all know, had never planned on being president, he hadn't planned on being vice president. And, um, and it was, you know, Nelson Rockefeller just was not going to say no. He had done other things for other presidents in terms of special commissions and gone off and done reports. But Nelson Rockefeller, uh, and there's a great biography about him, really was a unique person that, you know, we just don't see anymore. Somebody so rich that they could do whatever they wanted, and that meant they were not beholding the special interest. And he made that very clear as some people tried to influence him, and he was not going to do certain things. But then he enters the White House, and the realities come into play, as they have for every vice president. And, um, and particularly in an era of television where you see it. It was one thing when Harry Truman was vice president. Nobody really thought that much or saw that much of the vice president. But now Nelson Rockefeller, who was clearly out there in the public often, um, married to Happy Rockefeller, who was a very gregarious person as well. And, um, and now you're forced to you know, kind of sit in the back and do certain jobs. And it was tough. And I think that's... Your dad points out in the book that um, it was that when Rockefeller obviously was going to do what he said he would do, which was whatever the president wanted. So he asked to he, he submitted his resignation. But it was, in fact, a humiliation for him after a life in public service. And as Dad points out in the book, it was really, it was a deep wound and it was one from which he never really recovered. Because he had laid himself out, he laid his family's fortunes out for the confirmation committee. Right. Uh, the Rockefeller family fortunes were completely laid there. And then he was sort of ignominiously uh, dismissed two years later because they wanted to roll the dice and see if they could uh, pull in the conservatives who were um, obviously, objecting to the Rockefeller vice presidency. Um, i just touch briefly on Ford confirmation. Um, really, Congress is, uh, is, is laid out in the book. I mean, Congress, uh, the Speaker of the House and the Majority Leader are the ones that made Jerry Ford uh, president because they were the ones who told Richard Nixon that Jerry Ford, President, uh, well, Congressman Ford, is the only person that can get confirmed by the House and the Senate as vice president. And that's uh, detailed uh, better than I can explain, but it's detailed very well in the book. The whole process, Nixon wanted John Connolly. John Connolly, however, had been uh, a Democrat and switched to Republican, so the Republicans saw him as an opportunist, and the Democrats saw him as a turncoat, and uh, Nixon insisted that his people keep going to the Hill to try to get John Connolly, to get the thumbs up for John Connolly, and uh, basically, uh, one of Nixon's staff was told, the 
there will be blood running out from under the door of the Senate cloakroom before John Connolly gets confirmed. So um, Congress really is the one that told Nixon as much that uh, that's the only, Gerald Ford is the only person that we're going to accept as vice president. And if you're at the Ford Museum, you'll see there's a letter from Congressman Jerry Ford, who was the minority leader, to the president saying, here's the list of candidates. And there's some irony that the first one is John Connolly, because, of course, Jerry Ford wasn't thinking of himself, but these were the kind of the more popular. And there's a tally vote in the museum that shows you know, who had kind of the marks. And while John Connolly had the highest numbers, still wasn't much. But, uh, and again, the book is great to think of. I mean, imagine the president and the, the Senate majority leader and the, the Speaker of the House go in and basically said, here's the guy you're going to get. And I can imagine that would have been an interesting conversation for the president to be told, uh, you know, you can have, it's like the Hobson's choice. You can have any car you want, provided it's that car. Now, Jim, you pointed out that Nelson Rockefeller never aspired to the vice presidency or planned to hold it. Same can be said for Gerald Ford. Right. And another theme that I think emerges in some intriguing ways in the book is that this was someone whose entire political career was spent in the legislative branch, in the minority, without engagement or preparation or vetting in a national campaign for thinking about what it would be like to shift to the executive branch. And clearly, early on, there are some problems and some miscues, but the book makes the case that an executive style by that second and third year in the Ford administration were really beginning to take hold. Can you tell us about that transition from pure legislative branch, thinking about retirement, to suddenly having to be a chief executive and develop an executive style? Well, when President, if President Ford thought part of the problem that President Nixon had was he delegated way too much authority to his staff, uh, notably his chief of staff, Al Haig, and there's interesting the, the arrogance of how Al Haig really comes through in this book, in that Al Haig basically said he would stay on his chief of staff. He told President Ford he would stay on his chief of staff on his, Al Haig's, terms, which uh, I'm sure took the president back a little bit back. But um, what was, was fascinating for me to read about was how the president thought that, President Ford thought that he was going to be able sort of to run his office as the chief of staff but he quickly learned that there was just too many things coming into the inbox every day. He couldn't make every decision. He couldn't meet with every person that he uh, that wanted to meet with him to ask for his advice and opinion and decision. So he was he he, he learned on the job. He became an excellent excellent executive, and he got a chief of staff. And he was a strong chief of staff and a deputy chief of staff, and he basically became the decision maker. And by the time he left office. He was an excellent executive, and uh, he, was a, he was a person who made a decision based on the facts. He listened to everybody's advice, and he made the decision, and then he moved on. He never second-guessed himself. He was very sure of himself, and as he said uh, before he took office, uh, before Nixon resigned, he said, I never aspired for office, but I never had any doubt that I was capable of doing the job with 25 years of experience in, in Congress. You, uh thought comes to my mind, which is um, Jerry Ford, one thing that made him so special was he didn't mind losing. He, he'd been in the minority for so long as the minority leader that he knew, uh, unlike today it seems, you're not going to win a lot of battles, if any, but you're still going to do what you think you need to do. And as part of his character being so thorough, on the committee assignments and legislative, then when the time arises for him to move to this executive position. And, you know, Scott and I worked on Senator Domenici's staff at separate times, and Senator's staff is fairly large size, comparatively speaking, and you have some large size egos on there that go along with it. But a congressman's staff at headquarters and in the, you know, in the district is really quite small. I almost went to work for uh, a congressman as a follow-on, and you realize the staff is only seven people, or eight, and it's not many, whereas the, the senators may have 20, 25, which is a huge staff when you're only seven. So 
he, President Ford, had been used to a very small office. And then, of course, you'd have an office in Grand Rapids. And um, he, he did, as you said, he, he had some false starts in terms of wanting to do things the way he, he did. But then he brought in Don Rumsfeld, who quickly was able to show him this is not going to work. You, you have to delegate and let us get you the information. And they understood that type of information. Um, you know, I'm not a PowerPoint fan for many reasons. Uh, because everybody wants to make major decisions on four slides or something, but uh, maybe six with the quad chart. But Jerry Ford, and you read about it, you know, he wanted the in-depth analysis so that he would study it. And he would take the time, which then meant he got all the right inputs, was thoroughly versed in the subject to then make a decision. And, um, and is, you know, he's somebody that actually understood the appropriations bills, he, he really knew the details. So when the time came for him, after some false starts on terms of leadership and management, but he never lost that technical ability and background in, the, in thoroughness. So when he, with Don Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney, got the, the organizational structure redone, you know, he was ready to be exactly what he was, which was a great president, thorough, confident, who um, made tough decisions but he could stand by him because he understood what it meant. You know, he understood the implications. And can you say a little more about building a talent pool? Because indeed, one challenge in this case was not only to walk into the presidency unelected, but to be surrounded by staff like the chief of staff, Al Haig, who you had not appointed, who you as the president had not had that relationship. And yet, over time, you begin to see a lot of new faces, including your dad, but other figures as well about that, that kind of transition that actually takes place within a, a single president, presidential term. Well, he, um, I, I think that he was, because President Ford had a very decent nature, he, and he also wanted to, he, he wanted some continuity, obviously, because of the turmoil that had engulfed the White House for a number of years. So he didn't go in, as I, as I read history, um, he didn't go in and basically make wholesale changes and, and send people packing and bring, bring his own people in. Um, he tried to be as circumspect and respectful of people's egos and images as he could. There were some people uh, like uh, Schlesinger and Al Hay who sort of uh, wrote their own wrote their own history, if you will, because of their because of the way they presented themselves to the, the president, but. Um, I think he did it gradually because he wanted to build a solid staff and uh, one that he was comfortable with and people that he trusted. Uh, and he, you know, he had his own people, of course, when he went in. Uh, Bob Hartman was one, and Al, that was one instance where Al Haig says, "Well, the first person who has to go." Well, that was, I think, on day one. And uh, President Ford had no problems at all telling Al Haig, "I'll deal with Bob Hartman. He's not, he's not your problem." So. You know, it wasn't that he was going to be cowed by anyone, but he also was not, he was not a president who was going to be the first day he was going to be a bully. And I think that that relates to his experience. The leadership and, is that when he joined the Navy and, um, you know, went away for a couple of years and really saw profoundly good leadership in World War II, in crises, in, uh, you know, during, you know, typhoons and, and just you know, during combat, so he was prepared for it. And I think also, he, when he recognized somebody had talent, and that's, the, that's part of the neat story about how uh, Dick Cheney came into the White House. He knew Donald Rumsfeld, he brought him on as the chief of staff, and uh, as the story goes, Dick Cheney was introduced to the president, and the president said, well, is this your guy, Don? Don Rumsfeld said, he's my guy. And then he said, then he's your guy indeed. I trust your judgment. And so he, when he had confidence, just as he did with our dad, when he said, okay, you're no longer on the vice president's staff. I want you to be on my staff. And um, you know, he made those decisions. I think a lot of it is that, that character. Uh, we talk, there's a series that dad was involved in called Character Above All, where Jerry Ford knew how to recognize people of quality and leadership 
and when he picked them, and all you have to do, again, referring back to the museum where we were yesterday, you know, you look at the wall of the people, and we know some of them still, Scott and I, Carla Hills and um, Mr. Coleman, who I think is Secretary of Transportation, just absolutely stunning candidates that you don't go to work for somebody like that simply because they're the president. Because you don't know what's going to happen in two years, but you go because you realize this is a great stand-up guy who you know, has his own great reputation. That's why he was picked as vice president, obviously. President Ford was very uh, adamant that he wanted the best people around him, and he had no, he had no qualms at all about having very bright people around him because he wanted the best advice, he wanted the best insights, but then he knew that he was the final decision. He made that decision and moved on. Clearly not a bully, clearly wanted good people, and clearly had great confidence in other people. At times, almost a kind of innocence, if you will, that good things would happen, that if he announced a pardon, the American people would understand. If he proposed conditional amnesty for those who decided not to serve militarily in Vietnam, the American people would understand. That Ronald Reagan would not challenge him for the Republican nomination. That if he put forward Nelson Rockefeller, Republicans would come together. Time and again, there are cases where a seemingly almost a kind of innocence or confidence in people's willingness to agree to him kind of shocked him a little bit, and yet he had to respond. How do you describe that process and that, and that, and that approach to governance? Well, I, I think that the word I would use is not an innocence, but a faith. You look at the time and chance book, how he was raised, you know, the three rules. Do your homework, you know, in effect, tell the truth, and show up for dinner on time. It's a great quote from Dad's first book. But I think especially that business of telling the truth. And you're going to be honest, and why wouldn't you be honest? Because the only people that are dishonest, so to speak, are not people you want to be around. And so as these events like Dick Nixon, when he asked him, is there an issue? And he was told, no. I'm going to believe that guy because he was a man of great integrity. And as the, the, um, as the title, Time and Chance, the subtitle, The Appointment with History, here is somebody with such integrity and honesty that, uh, I mean, imagine he, he proposes to Betty Ford and says, but, you know, we've got to kind of keep it quiet, and, uh, but just bear with me, of course, because he's going to run for office. But once he's in, he's all in, and just as he was with, uh, I was noticing out front here, it says when he got married, uh, Betty Ford was told, uh, you don't ever have to worry about him having another woman. The other woman in his life will be his work, because it's that important. So I think it's this faith that, and this belief that you as a public servant, and he saw it in the Navy, he saw it in his mother, and I think it's a great story about why he loved his stepfather, who he considered his father, a person of integrity and honesty, and there wasn't any, um, there wasn't any going off that path. And I know um, Dick Parsons, who was my our, our father's counselor when Dad was in the White House, said it very well at the memorial service that Dad said to him, "There's only one way we're going to be. We're going to be right down the middle of the road. We're not going to start veering off to the left or right. It's all about integrity. I'm about that. The president's about that because that's what got President Nixon and all of his people." but it's a faith in oneself and honesty and integrity. And I think that's why some of the things, like many people, who could believe that the president would, would basically, as we say, be an unindicted co-conspirator? Any honest person would have discovered what these people had done, they'd done something illegal, and just would have summarily fired them, because you'll find more good people. So I think faith, and of course he had tremendous religious faith in his life, that was the other aspect. I think the two came together. So that's just my thoughts. What comes to me, what comes through the two books is that President Ford had, there was no guile about him. He was not a suspicious, devious person. And I think it was very difficult for him to assume that other people had those qualities. So he knew Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon was one of the first people that introduced themselves to. Gerald Ford, and Gerald Ford went to Washington as a congressman. 
for his time. So he's known this man for many years. It, it was beyond his, I think it was beyond, uh, well, it was beyond then uh, Congressman Ford's uh, comprehension that somebody as clever and um, experienced as Richard Nixon would be involved in any aspect of Watergate. So I, I think just Gerald Ford's basic character, his character above all, his honesty, uh, kind of misled him, if you will, that everyone had the same basic decency about him. And I think that's where he, he sort of got in trouble occasionally because he thought everybody else had the same level of integrity. I think that's tagged onto that as he was growing up when they talk about him as a football player. He never played dirty, and he, he was always fair and honest. And there's the great story of his integrity when, uh, when he was with the, the football team and there was an African-American and the other team didn't want to play with that gentleman on the team. And he said, He's not, if you don't let him play, we're not playing. So he had a faith in what was to be done was right. And throughout his life, when you read about it, he, you know, you don't swear and you don't lie and you don't drink and you, you don't do all these things that get you on the wrong path. And that's, I think, faith in yourself and others. Fair enough. My preference would be to continue asking you questions long into the night, but I think it's only fair to democratize this and allow others to, to join in. As was mentioned at the outset, there's a microphone at the back of the center aisle and for those of you who would like to get into a queue and ask questions, this would be a wonderful time to, to go back and, and we can open up the conversation. If we don't have the answer, we'll tell you. We will? Yes. <laughs> but the microphone is back there because it is being recorded. So right. while it's nice to stand up, then the, then, you know, then the YouTube video won't have you on there and you won't be infamous forever. That's right. Would anyone like to ask a question? Oh, here we go. There's always got to be a first question. I'll, I'll ask the audience a question, because we were sitting next to this lady. How many people knew Jerry Ford that were in here? You obviously did. You got to go to the White House. That's right. No, I can't see those hands. They go up here. Higher. In the back. One, two, three. Okay. Oh, that's uh, good, too. <laughs> Please go right ahead. Okay, your, your dad was good friends with Nelson Rockefeller. Your dad was good friends with Gerald Ford. In early 1976, when Rockefeller was taken off the ticket, does, does he confide in you any kind of disappointment that you know, you're not going with Rockefeller anymore you know, as a domestic person? It, was there any, any issues that, that, that he would have discussed whether Rockefeller should have stayed on the ticket or not? Uh, well, Dad never discussed it with me. I, I don't know if he discussed it with Jim. Um, but, I mean, I think it was, if you, the way the story is, comes across in the book, Dad was uh, aghast when he learned that uh, the, president, the vice president was going to submit his resignation uh, from the ticket or basically say he was not going to be a candidate for the vice presidency uh, again. And... Um, my father went into the office to talk to uh, Nelson Rockefeller to try to talk him out of it. And he says that he wanted the rare displays of anger, um, or, or frustration and anger from Nelson Rockefeller. His eyes narrowed and he said, Jim, I was asked to do this. So um, that's why I say, it, to me, it's one of the more interesting aspects of the book. It's, it's been really addressed elsewhere. But uh, I think it was a deep wound uh, that Nelson Rockefeller felt, and that um, I think he carried it with him after he, he, he's part of the reason he accepted the nomination, or I should say the, I guess it was a nomination to go through the confirmation process as vice president was he had four terms as governor in New York, and his wife agreed that this would be a good way to end his public service career. Um, and obviously, the two years is not what they had in mind. They thought that they would you know, be on the ticket uh, from, from heck or high water. And only weeks before he submitted his resignation, um, President Ford had, had told a, a, an audience of some sort that he thought 
uh, Rockefeller was doing a great job as vice president. So um, I think it was a difficult time. Dad was, of course, caught sort of in the middle. And I think Dad always felt the tension there between his allegiance to Nelson Rockefeller. And in fact, uh, he was initially, he was going to dedicate this new book to Rockefeller and Art Corn and other person he worked with. Um, and that's, that's alluded to in the afterword I wrote. But he always, he always felt a great debt to Nelson Rockefeller for giving him the chance to get into politics, which he thought was a very noble profession, as I said. But he also felt uh, a complete allegiance to President Ford. In fact, a quick story, um, when President, when, when uh, Vice President Rockefeller was proposing new ideas to the White House staff, at that point they had to be shopped through Dad's domestic policy staff. And of course that was an awkward position for Dad. And uh, he spoke to Dick Parsons, who was his counselor, and said, you know, I'm, I'm kind of torn, what do I do? Dick Parsons said to him, uh, he said, well, whose signature is on that commission on your wall? And Dad said, President Ford's. And Dick Parsons said, well, there's your answer. So, um, but, you know, Dad was a, he was a very decent person, obviously, and he always felt, I think he always felt kind of a, a sadness that there had been this separation. I don't think he ever had the same closeness that he had with Nelson Rockefeller. And I know that, uh, I was in D.C. at the time when uh, my father was there working the, the vice president for confirmation and would go with him and uh, was actually got to sit um, in, in the chamber when they confirmed Nelson Rockefeller. Whoops, man. Sorry. Well, that woke us up. Sorry, okay. Make no hand, keep hand from Mike. Anyway, um, but you know, it's a very grueling process for Nelson Rockefeller and you know his his brothers were not happy about the nomination because they certainly did not need the Rockefeller whatever you want to call it the Rockefeller wealth and influence and control um, of various sectors of the economy and the like laid out for the public to see and I know my dad worked with Nelson Rockefeller on exactly that because he had been when he worked for Governor Rockefeller, the, the inner, you know, worked with Congress on the intergovernmental side. And so it, I think he um, really felt that this was a, a bad choice and that Nelson Rockefeller deserved to be kept as well as he should be kept because he was a great asset to the, uh, to the team and not taking anything away from Bob Dole, but uh, one of those people when Bob Dole was announced as the candidate, you know, my first question was, you know, who's Bob Dole? Yes, he's a senator, but, you know, that doesn't mean national recognition, whereas um, I don't think anybody doesn't know the name Rockefeller, so to speak. So but it, The reality was, too, that uh, they expected a bump in the polls because they thought that the conservatives would uh, be happy that Rockefeller was off the ticket. Ironically, what a lot of conservatives saw was instead a weakness in uh, the presidential decision-making in that they could sort of cow him into uh, bending uh, his, his vice presidential ticket to their will. So, I mean, that was, it was, a, it was a failed attempt, I guess, to boost their standing with the conservatives who had, who had resented Rockefeller from the outset. In the end, Gerald Ford needed Rockefeller one last time. Do you want to talk about that? Well, he, uh, he well, going back also to your thing about faith, uh, Rockefeller was very, dis I'm sorry, uh, but President Ford was very dismayed when he got the call from uh, Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan said, I'm just letting you know I'm going to run. And uh, President Ford says, well, I think this is a mistake. You're going to divide the party. And uh, Ronald Reagan said, no, I don't think that's true. Well, obviously, it was, uh, was self-serving for Ronald Reagan to do that. But uh, Ronald Reagan presented such a strong challenge that they basically had to go to uh, Nelson Rockefeller and ask him to deliver the New York delegates to defeat Ronald Reagan and deliver the uh, nomination to President Ford. So, I mean, as I said, Rockefeller was a stand-up guy to the end. And, and you'll never convince me that, and again, not criticizing Bob Dole, who's a great American, who you know, certainly you know, was a great World War II veteran, but when you look at the political you know, the electoral votes and how it laid out, um, you're just not going to convince me that Senator Dole got 
brought to Jerry Ford what he needed, and yet you look at that electoral map that shows how the Northeast went, and you know Nelson Rocker was was an influential person in the Northeast, but that's all history, and it's still amazing to think that Jerry Ford came back from a 30-point deficit to lose to Jimmy Carter by three points, and uh, so a little bit of Republican bias here, as a Rockefeller Republican, I should add. But there's, uh, there was some pleasure that Jimmy Carter only had one term, and it was due to some people like our father who, who was involved in helping the Republicans get back into office. But I think it's always interesting that as much as people did not vote for uh, Jerry Ford, at the end of four years, they decided President Carter, it was time for him to go. But that's just an editorial comment. <laughs> du duly noted. We have time for one final question. Would anyone like to seize the microphone to offer that question? Yes, sir. The floor is yours. We're going to expand for two questions. But not three. We got a book signing. It's all yours. And if somebody else, excuse me, if somebody else would like to get in line next, please do so. Uh, your father, in that introduction, said briefly that the Vietnam War ended, of course, uh, during his term, but not in the way he wanted it to. Um, I don't know how many Vietnam veterans are in this audience, but um, for those, for many of us, uh, when we left Vietnam, we thought we had left a fairly robust army in place, a South Vietnamese army that with the proper financial and armament support could have maybe succeeded in establishing a South Vietnam. Uh, a lot of us, of course, very disappointed that so, many people, so much blood and honor was uh, left over there and, and that uh, South Vietnam was never established. Um, we felt maybe that uh, President Ford helped pull the rug out from the support that uh, South Vietnam maybe deserved at that time. Could you comment on that? Well, it's my understanding, I was, I mean, I, I only know what I've read about and talked to Dad about, but it's my understanding that Ford pushed hard to get more money, but the Congress cut off the funding for all military aid and told him the only thing that they, that Congress would fund was humanitarian aid and basically getting the troops out. So basically, Congress ended the war despite the president's uh, desire to see it through to a, a more honorable end, is, is my understanding. I, I've never heard that uh, President Ford pulled the rug out from under the military. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's very clear in the book that President Ford specifically had his, uh, actually sent, um, in the book it talks about, he sent David Kennerly, who's a fabulous photographer, and would give him kind of ground truth because David Kennerly could go talk to anybody, and then he sent, I believe it was, it's in the book, one of the generals uh, from the Army to get an assessment, and they both came back, and what David Kennerly says, you know, it's not hopeless, but here's what it's going to take, and the general came back and said, again, it's not hopeless, but here's what it's going to take, X amount of dollars to, uh, you know, as you said, to support the military and keep it from just falling to pieces in Congress. Very interesting to me in terms of compared to these current wars that we're trying to end. Um, they said, no, you're not getting it, and, uh, and it's, it's detailed in the book. And there, now Jerry, President Ford, was faced with the true, um, a true dilemma of, I have X amount of, someone in the Navy, you have X amount of money that you have left to get everybody out. And you may have some money for humanitarian aid, but at the end of that amount of money, you will not have any more. So the forces, whatever that dollar amount is, has to be used to get all the troops out. And that's where you see these terrible pictures of the helicopter getting everybody out they can, and then just, you know, we would say in the Navy, pulling chocks and just walking away. And of course, we know the result was a, a complete collapse. But Jerry Ford, did, and Scott's right, it's detailed in the book, not in favor of it wanted to give it a shot and felt that there was no reason that the United States could not, be, beyond simply military spending, could not have had a success there. Because, of course, he looked at Korea and he saw what had been done there under some very good leadership.
What a you, wonderful. You see, Elaine, I just want to, you know, everyone's so nice to come here, but really the Ford Foundation and the Ford Library and the Ford Museum are, are so critical to the fact that our dad's book is even out. And um, the University of Michigan School of uh, Public Policy, where Barry is, that, you know, the reality is Scott did an incredible amount of work with some other people to pull the, the writing, but really it was people who had a great faith and respect for President Ford. And I was here in 2004 when the, the, the uh, groundbreaking ceremony for the University of Michigan School that Sandy Weil, and I forget his wife's name, um, from Citibank, they, they sponsored it. And so, to me, Jerry Ford had a tremendous love of Michigan, obviously, and that was given back to him by the university because they made this book possible, as well as the Ford Foundation and the library. And that isn't just a plug, but I think we know that without all these people, and... Um, this was a group effort. We yeah. appreciate it. Yeah. Well, this is a special program as well because I've had the privilege of knowing uh, Jim Cannon since taking this job in 2005. Jim was not only one of our trustees, but the head of the Journalism uh, Awards Committee, always uh, welcomed me to the National Press Club for the awards, introduced me to various people, uh, was always so warm and kind, and of course had great relationships with our archivists. So I was sort of on the wings of that. I, I didn't work with him as much directly, but he was always very, very supportive and welcoming. To follow up on a, a little bit of the discussion before we close, uh, first of all, let me tell you that a, a book is coming out on Rockefeller. Richard Norton Smith, who is right. one of my pre predecessors, is finishing up his work on that. He's doing the uh, editing and the index right now. Right. That will be done, I, he thinks, by the fall, so that that will be coming out in the next year or so. And so those of uh, you who are Rockefeller fans, keep an eye out for that, and I'm sure we'll invite Richard to speak. Secondly, on the Vietnam question, that's a very good one. Um, I can provide some fresh information because we are, we are starting, as of October 9th this, uh, this year, is the 40th anniversary of the swearing-in of Gerald Ford as president. This whole okay. saga of the presidency begins. And that also begins a two-and-a-half-year period where we will be planning special programs, retrospectives, uh, looking back at accomplishments and challenges of the presidency. One of the biggest ones that we're working on already has to do with uh, Vietnam and the American pullout. So look ahead to April of 2015. The program is still in the planning stages with uh, support from Ambassador Peter Secchia in Grand Rapids, uh, who takes great umbrage that the Nixon Library and Foundation announced that Nixon had ended the war. He did sign the peace accords. I mean, you have to get into the, the nuances and the technicalities here. But it was Ford who authorized the humanitarian effort and, of course, uh, there is right now a play on Operation Baby Lift has just been done. It will debut in New Jersey uh, coming up. So there, there are going to be a lot of things. But I would encourage our Vietnam vets and all of you that the papers of the Ford Library are open for you to review. And uh, a lot of it is also on our website already. So uh, take a look. And we're in the actively digitizing additional information. But feel free to come in person and look at the cables and look at the transmissions. And yes, look at the record of the congressional actions and what Congress wouldn't, but it, it's a fascinating period. And uh, yes, it, it didn't end the way we wanted to. So we thank you, Barry and Scott and Jim, for being here. And uh, this has been a, a wonderful program, both about the book, but the process of the book, which I think is an interesting uh, peek behind the scenes. We have gifts for you, which I will present afterward. Uh, they are uh, pen sets with President Ford's signature embossed, oh, wow. and you can use those for your book signing afterward. <laughs> Um, but before we close, let me do a commercial for some upcoming programs. Um, it, for, here at the library, Betty Ford's birthday is April 8th, and uh, in honor of her uh, birthday coming up, we will have, on the, on the 24th, we will have historian Elida Black discussing First Ladies, and her talk is titled, Outspoken Women, What Eleanor Roosevelt and Betty Ford Taught Us About Leadership. Uh, she's a very dynamic, flamboyant speaker and wonderful historian, so I encourage you to come to that. At the museum in Grand Rapids, and it's only two hours drive away, as these gentlemen drove over this morning. Um, we have on April 3rd, Yannick Michkowski. If you missed him talking about Eisenhower's Sputnik moment here at the library, we're bringing him back to the museum. April 8th, on Betty Ford's birthday, birthday we have First Lady Rosalind Carter speaking at a luncheon, and uh, that will be a big draw. On the 13th of May, Rick Atkinson, uh, is uh, speaking about his third volume of the Liberation Trilogy, The Guns at Gas, Last Light, 
The War in Western Europe, 1944-45. He's a wonderful speaker and researcher, so that'll be a terrific program. Wednesday, June 4th is the 70th, uh, well, actually the 6th is the 70th anniversary of D-Day. We're having a reunion of the 501st Airborne at the museum, and just prior to that, on June 4th, we're having John McManus talking about the dead and those about to die, D-Day, the big red one at Omaha Beach. And then on July 14th, which is Gerald Ford's 101st birthday, we will be having the traditional replaying. We're opening a feature exhibit called Taking the Seas, the Rise of the American Carrier, which will, of course, feature information about the new technologies on the USS Gerald R. Ford and also the history of aircraft carriers. So that'll be opening. And there will be a luncheon address by Secretary of State James Baker. So a lot planned, and then again, starting at, in August, a 40th year, two and a half year series of events. So we encourage you to come to events at both places. We thank you for coming tonight, and thank our speakers also for speaking last night at the museum when there was a flash snowstorm a half an hour before the program. <laughs> this is spring in Michigan this year, so we got lucky, and uh, thank you for coming. We have a reception in the lobby, book signing in the lobby with uh, Jim and Scott, and of course a chance to talk with all three of our speakers. So thanks for coming and we'll see you out in the lobby.